I'd like to back up a little bit and talk about the question of performance uh, with electronic thingies. Yeah. And um, my work has always been about live performance. And at the time I started as a composer in the 70s, uh, it, I didn't think this was very unusual. These, these things were in the air. <coughs> uh, this was the heyday of minimalist uh, experimental music and sort of there was a trickle down of technology from a number of sectors um, in a way that made technology and certain genres of music uh, very compatible, like people who read their horoscopes before picking up the opposite sex or the same sex in a bar. You know, you're sort of predestined, starstruck. And uh, in the course of the 80s, everything shifted, and I think that the domain of electronic technology moved from what we might call experimental music or contemporary music or serious music into pop. And there were a number of economic factors having to do with this. I mean, obviously, if you're in the business of selling something, you want a large public. Yeah? I mean, this is capitalism 101, right? Um, and I suppose that uh, producing instruments for avant-garde music is like producing literature for extreme forms of sexual fetishism. You know, that, yes, there's someone out there who would kill to have that one about wellies and you, but maybe, maybe not as, as much as uh, the Da Vinci Code. So, um, I, I watched as the, as the proliferation of this technology meant that there were many, many more opportunities and, and technologies to work with, uh, yet they, they lost their specialness. You know, they lost their specialness <coughs> in terms of identification with a particular scene. Um, as if you discovered that everybody had been to Woodstock, that it wasn't only you. So um, I went down various lines of, of work as a composer and a performer, but it, there was always this notion that uh, my work was about performance, and yet I didn't play any traditional instrument. And so it was a question of adapting technology that really was being designed for a studio environment, either a studio environment or the performance of uh, equal-tempered music <coughs> based on rhythm and melody and harmony. And I was trying to squeeze this stuff into rather different forms of musical performance. And most of my work, I think, has to do with really kind of cliched minimalist ideas about exploring phenomena of various sorts. I mean, I studied with Alvin Lussier, you know, the ultimate, you know, follow a line for a long time kind of guy, and uh, David Tudor. And it was very much about this music as, a, as, as listening to the act of discovery rather <coughs> than going through the motions of playing something again and again and again, one night to another. And um, certain instruments work well for this and certain don't. And this is something you learn in every orchestration class, right? Some instruments do glissandi better than others. Some instruments play loud better than others. Some instruments do exploration better than others. And having started with analog electronics as my prime medium, and then slowly moving into working more and more with computers, I've always been conscious of stylistic differences of working in those two media. And um, I just was talking with someone a couple of nights ago, and the, the, term that, the term that came to mind, which might make sense uh, in this context, is adjacency that when you play an acoustic instrument or an electroacoustic instrument, to use one definition of the term, like say, electric guitar, there are certain issues of adjacency that affect the way you play. Your hands go to a certain place on the instrument. You, you get a sound going by touching something directly. 
And then what's interesting is that that adjacency leads to particular connections. Like for example, when you play a note on the guitar, it's a very easy thing to then take the pick and move it very close to the string so that the string rattles against the pick and deadens off while isolating a very particular odd harmonic because you're not in a position where you've done any kind of geometric division of the string the way you might if you were going to say play an overtone intentionally. So that's a very specific electric guitar sound. You all heard it. Right? Now, let's move to the computer as a situation. Very powerful sound production tool. Everybody here probably has used a computer to generate sound. It is very easy to generate a pretty convincing single string of an electric guitar on a computer. One of my classmates at Wesleyan, his name is enshrined in computer music uh, literature because he happened to be one half of the dynamic duo of Carplus and Strong, who invented, dare I say it, the plucked string algorithm. <coughs> But the problem is that when you initiate a plucked string algorithm on a computer like this, if you move your finger a little bit to the left on the key, you can't buzz the pick against the string. It's not, it's not there. It is not adjacent. It, a computer is like having a, a house that's too big. Now, when you're from New York, this seems like impossible. How could you ever? <laughs> Have a place that you didn't have crap falling on your head all the time. Um, but maybe a computer is like moving into too big a house. And when you're cooking and you reach for the salt, it's always on the other side of the room. It's never where you need it. You want a Pullman kitchen. Um, and like a big house, a computer has infinite potential for doing stuff. Yeah? It's just a question of how much time do you have to program. But whereas even a relatively drunk or stoned or stupid guitarist can move the pick back to the string and go, cool, yeah? Um, it takes a long time to move that pick on a computer. And you really have to think about it. And you've got to say no to the second beer if you're going you know, to get there tonight. So I think that... Um, One of the issues in, in programming is, has to do with how you steer yourself through software. And if you have a goal in mind, like I want to imitate the adjacency of the pick on an electric guitar, you have to create a new, a new adjacency. I mean, you've got to build that bridge between those two events. And that might be easier, it might be difficult, but the odds are it's going to take much longer in a computer environment where everything is equally easy or equally difficult. Now, on the other hand, what you can do is you can look for what's next to the pick in the computer because there is always something. It's just it may not be what you originally wanted to do. And I think that the history of, of sort of experimental music's exploitation of technology is about looking for that adjacency within electronic technology. After all, David Tudor called his merry band composers inside electronics. And the ethos of that group, you know, as I remember very well from, from working with them, was, you know, finding out in a sort of cliched Michelangelo-esque notion of musical construction, you know, what is the music that resides in, in this? You know, what is the music that resides in this? What is the music that resides in this? Not like I want to make a piece for an alarm clock, but what piece of music would the alarm clock make if you let it? I mean, clearly this is the legacy of years of smoking pot in the 1960s, you know, <laughs> let the sounds be. And that just determined the whole sort of heady ethos of that time. But you know, it, it, put, it puts one in a slightly odd position, which is that, you know, you can, you can either approach the technology with the idea of sort of seeing what the technology suggests and what it does naturally and easily, or you can approach it with the notion that 
It's a tabula rasa, and it's tremendously powerful, and one could theoretically do anything if one just worked hard.